Good morning, Calvary. It's great to see all your wonderful faces. I like to say Merry Christmas and Happy Coming New Year. Not Happy New Year, but Happy Coming New Year. Because we have two more days to deal with some issues in our hearts, to deal with some issues in our minds, so that we can have a very good start in the year. Is that correct? I think so. By the way, let me see, let's, uh, please put your hand up if you don't have the outline and you like the ushers to get you the outlines. They will be pleased to do that. It is a great privilege for me to be able to share with you today. It is even more so a privilege for me to be a member of this church community. I count Pastor Tim and the pastoral team and the staff are some of the most gracious, caring, loving people I have had the privilege to serve under. For so many years, I began ministry as a late teenage guy. For so many years, I was always pastoring. This is the first church that I am actually a member, and it is a blessing to really have a pastoral team that are truly my pastors. We are blessed at Calvary. I continue to ask that you pray for our pastors. You'll be nice and gentle and kind to them as much as possible. Amen? Is that a deal? As we think about Christmas, we had so many wonderful things that went on. We watched some nice performances here. We listened to great sermons. We are now getting to the new year, and believe it or not, we have switched quickly, and maybe too quickly, into the tradition of Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. What does that mean? I do want to encourage you this morning as we go to the Word of God. And before that, let me quickly say that I am the executive director of Africa Potential. It is an organization that Calvary supports, and Calvary has been very gracious to us. We help young women, young girls in African countries to be able to get high school education, and we help train leaders in various platforms, and Calvary has been a great support uh, for that. And that actually has relieved me a great deal because I always had to be on the road to try to make sure that I can get the funding needed to be able to help those young women that we have made commitment to be able to go to school. Since Calvary is stepping in, it has helped me a great deal, and I think I have lost fewer hair. Uh, yeah. You may think it makes no difference, but it does, especially when it's cold. Jokes aside, it's been great. It's been great to be in this place. Today, I'm speaking on the topic, free to flourish. Free to flourish. There are two powerful emotions that can make or break you in the year 2019. These emotions have the ability to restrain to imprison, to confine you. And it also, they also have the ability to unleash you to destroy so many things. The first of these two emotions is fear. The second is anger. I will not talk a lot about fear today because the Christmas story deals with that. As one who spends some time in Egypt almost every year for quite some years now, almost every year I have the privilege to see a mummified body. But you see, fear 
It's one powerful emotion that has the ability to mummify living human beings. To trap you in there and hold you for thousands of years if you have the ability to live that way. And you never live to be able to flourish because fear has imprisoned you. Fear has held you captive. Fear has put you into a place where your desires and what you want to do don't match. God says, step out and see what I can do with you. Fear says, shut up, sit down, don't go up. And you say, yes, sir. (laughs) But you see, the Christmas story comes to change this story. Because in the Christmas story, a son will be born and his name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. We tend to be afraid when we feel alone, when we feel vulnerable, when we feel unable, when we feel we have nobody strong enough to be on our side. But if God is for us, who can be against us? The Bible has so many places in which we have the reference, fear not, be courageous. If you go through them, you may come across a pattern, a promise that often comes along with that phrase. And it goes like this. I will be with you. Be still. I am with you. I will be with you. In other words, God assures us of his presence It is power and majesty as that which should give us the courage to step out and be who he has called us to be because the powerful one is on our side. Mm -hmm. Whom should we be afraid of? The one who knows everything is on our side. What are we so afraid of? But today, I move to talk more about the second emotion, anger. My prayer and my hope is that today you will leave this place free to flourish because you have not allowed anger, a very powerful emotion, to set you up like a wildfire, to destroy the very things you wish to have around you. Anger is a strong emotion of displeasure that is often caused by real or perceived grievance. Sometimes the grievance is perceived, it's not real. Sometimes the grievance is real. It is a powerful emotion, and believe it or not, anger has the ability to right the wrong in your life, and it also has the ability to wrong the right in your life. We'll be reading and looking at Ephesians chapter 4 briefly. But let me remind you that if I were to ask you, you would tell me you have every reason to be angry. Yes. Yes. You may. But today, just hold on a minute because the text we are looking at from the scriptures will remind us of the fact that God is not interested in the cause of your anger today. God is not interested in the one who wronged you to make you angry. Your anger may be justifiable. You may have been taken advantage of. But perhaps you have allowed anger to take hold of your heart, 
take hold of your mind and set you up to be a destructive force. Too many parents say, my parents didn't do well. They left me angry. And I want to make sure my children don't go through that. And then they bring the same anger to their children. They put unnecessary expectations. And they make the children too angry. My prayer is that today you might be set free by the one who said, if the Son of Man sets you free, you shall be free indeed. But for the sake of comfort, maybe you want to be reminded that somebody understands maybe the cause of your anger. So let me say that it's true. Some of you have become angry because of emotional instability or unmet expectations. For some, you live in a very toxic environment. And you live with some toxic individuals that you don't have control over. And they just drive you crazy. They have put all the ability to develop the spiritual gift to test. I mean the fruit of the spirit. Some have become angry because they subjected themselves to substance abuse, sleeplessness, even smoke, and a lot of coffee. Oh, there is always some truth to the laughter. But some are angry because of disappointment, abuse, sexual, domestic, bullying, you name it. Some are angry because of discrimination. They have been discriminated against because of their gender, race, age, height, or stature. But there are some who are angry because of entitlement. Because they think they deserve something and people are not giving it to them, so they are angry. That form of anger sometimes is called tantrums. Don't tell somebody at home I said that. <laughs> but as we deal with anger, let me remind you about what a Greek philosopher said. Anybody can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power and it's not easy. That was said by Aristotle. But what does the Bible have to say about anger? Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 to 27 and verse 31 to 32 read be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no place to the devil. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Please, if you would, could you just pause for a minute with me in a prayer? Dear Lord, I pray for clarity of your word. I ask you greet me the grace to express and to explain your word clearly. May your Holy Spirit forgive. May your Holy Spirit liberate. May your Holy Spirit convict. And may you grant us the freedom we need to step out into 2019 victorious and free to flourish for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We are looking at this Ephesians test more closely. Ephesians, as a letter, was written to give believers who have come from Judaism, pagan religions, who practice magic and astrology, 
a firm grounding in the gospel. The letter also shows, and it's meant to show the triumph of God over the works of principalities and powers. The triumph of God over the work of evil spiritual powers in our world and how these powers seek to control and to destroy people God has made in his own image and likeness. Ephesians call Christians to live up to their calling, to embrace their true identity in Christ, and to live in unity. It is in that framework that the issue of anger comes up for discussion. Because anger has the ability to hinder God's people from flourishing. Anger has the ability to ruin personal lives, families, and even destroy friendships. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 reads, Be angry, but do not sin. Following from your outline, write this down. Point number one. Discipline. Discipline. Anger as a moral necessity. Discipline. I'm aware that I have accent. Most of you don't think I have accent. Thank you very much. I always speak in a way that makes you pay a little bit more attention. (laughs) Discipline. Anger as a moral necessity. The Bible says be angry but do not sin. This particular passage is very difficult for English translators to translate. So depending upon your Bible, some will say like the King James, be ye angry and sin not. The ESV will say, be angry and do not sin. The NIV will say, in your anger, do not sin. Do you notice the difference? Be angry and do not sin. And in your anger, do not sin. One is to say, be angry. But do not sin. One says, eh, just in case you become angry. (laughs) The good news says, if you become angry, do not let your anger lead you into sin. What is going on? You see, in the ancient world, philosophers and wise people have explain and discuss anger a great deal, and they try to explain the good form of anger and the bad form of anger. Anger is one of those things that cut both ways. Anger is a moral necessity. So the teacher in me is already acting up. Let me see my hands, those of you who don't get angry. Okay, okay, you are laughing, so I'm not sure about that. Let me see my hands, those of you Who do get angry? Okay, I see some people here didn't raise their hands. I think I saw some. I am looking for the saints among us. You see, there is a just anger the philosophers will discuss. There is what some will call righteous anger. The same Aristotle I quoted earlier once said, we praise a man who feels angry on the right grounds against the right persons and also in the right manner at the right moment and for the right length of time. But he goes on to say, you don't want to hang around with angry people. (laughs) Anger is a moral necessity. It is human to be angry And human beings do get angry. In Greek, it is very clear. Ephesians means to say, be angry. But do not sin. It's okay to be angry. God himself was angry. The just 
The righteous anger is okay. God himself expressed it. Exodus 22, verse 21 to 24 reads, Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. Something could provoke God to have the just anger. In Exodus 32, Moses was away. Aaron was with the people. They had decided to gather their jewels and make a statue of worship. God became ballistic. In Exodus 32, verse 9 to 10, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. And they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make you into a great nation. God himself will express this form of anger. But lest you think that God is like a wicked grandfather, so angry, looking for the slightest opportunity to be angry and smack you on the head and punch you on the back. Let me remind you that God's anger is always in contest. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger, yeah. abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Amen. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generations. Jesus himself expressed this form of anger. When he charged into the temple one day, because the people have turned the house of God into a den of robbers, as he's explained. Their interest in material things have taken precedence above that which is of God and that for which the temple was made to be. Jesus himself expressed this anger in more than one occasion. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. And here the Bible says, be angry. Be angry, but do not sin. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as we prepare to step into 2019, let me remind you of others. The greatest challenge we have in our world, not only in the United States, are Christians who are not angry about injustice, who are not angry about children who are being abused, who are not angry about sin, who are not angry about all kinds of things that God deplores. Two weeks ago, around this time, I was standing in Ghana. This is not America problem. I had to remind my fellow Africans, Christians are letting God down throughout the world. God cannot count on us anymore. Let those who are determined to stand up for the cause of Christ. Let those who are determined to show the world that we serve a God who is a just God, who is a decent, humane, loving God. He made all people in his image and likeness. And he wants us to stand up when sin is prevailing. We have become so selective Christians. We have become so selective in our reasoning. One thing is bad, the other is convenient. 
But please, I am not saying the Bible says go about and be angry. Because in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26, Paul established limits and consequences to anger. There is a righteous anger, yes. There is a just anger, yes. We should be angry against wrongdoing, yes. Amen. But there must be limits and consequence. Verse 26. Three limits and consequence. One. Be angry and what? Do not sin. Anger can lead to sin. Anger can lead you to violate what God wants you to be or to do. Anger is not a badge of honor to say, oh, in my family, people don't know us. When we charge, hmm, people don't know us. No. Be angry, first limit, do not sin. Second, anger should not be prolonged. Jesus cleansed the temple, he moves on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Do not let the sun set on your anger. It doesn't mean, let me clarify. It doesn't mean be angry at 10 p.m. <laughs> and you have all night to do whatever you like. And then in the morning you go, oh, it's just morning. And if it is the summer months, you drag it, you drag it, you drag it, you drag it, and it's six o'clock, say, oh no, I can see the sun. <laughs> oh, the sun said, 10 p.m., okay, now the sun should set on bank. No, 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 no. If you had coffee with Paul in heaven, he would tell you, that is not what he meant. What he meant was let anger be short-lived. That is where discipline comes in. Be angry for the right things, for the wrong things, and try to correct them. But because you are disciplined, you will not let anger lead to sin, and you will not allow anger to drag with you. You don't let it sit there and water it, and water it, and water it. But the third is a major consequence. Verse 27. In Greek as in most English translations, verse 26 of chapter 4 and verse 27 of Ephesians are one sentence. In other words, the phrase, and do not leave a place for the devil, is connected to anger. When you allow anger to stay long from within, you open two places for the devil to take hold of you, yeah. your mind and your heart. Yeah. And when prolonged anger is moving and working in your life, friends, 2019, you will be like a nice toy with the remote control in the hands of a five or six year old boy. He goes, shh, shh, shh. The devil will use you like that. And you will not flourish. My prayer and my aim is that God sets you free. That you do not allow yourself to be an instrument in the hands yeah. of the devil. Yeah. Robbing you of the very things God wants for you. Yeah. Robbing you of the very things you desire to have. Yeah. You may have New Year resolutions for external things. You may even have New Year resolution to lose weight. That is noble. But friends, if you don't deal with what is on the inside, you can gather yourself around with so many material possessions and you can build your bank account to whatever level. Your stock can go this. You will still know no peace and you will still not flourish. 
My prayer and my hope is that Jesus Christ, the one who came into our world to save us, will set you free from anger. If discipline is important, two, deliverance is a necessity. Following your outline, point number two, deliverance, free from destructive anger. When you look at verse 31, the verse lists five forms of anger and then use one verb to explain, let this be taken away from you. Let this be removed from you. As if to say, anger has taken so hold, so much hold of your life that you cannot help yourself. You need deliverance from God himself. You need to be released from God himself. You need to be set free to be a better person whose life brings glory to him. Deliverance. Free from destructive anger. Proverbs 16 verse 32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who makes a city. I like the reference in Psalm 4 verse 4 which says, Be angry and do not sin. And then it continues, meditate within your heart, in your bed, and be still. Can you imagine an angry person meditating within their heart, in a bed? Uh, Yeah, angry in bed and go like, I will chop off your head. And I will smack you on the back. I will boot you. They are winding themselves up. You know, I'm just going to pick something from the kitchen and just sweat them. And you are in bed sweating. <laughs> Meanwhile, the person who wronged you is eating ice cream. <laughs> Friends, God is not interested in the cause today. God is interested in setting you free. Because let me tell you quickly some hard truths. People who make you angry can be let go or you can allow them to control your life. They can control you on your own bed. They can hijack your prayer life. Every prayer you make is, God, do this to them. God, do this to them. Instead of even praising God, oh, God, I want you to just destroy them. They hijack your sleep. They hijack your life. They hijack your prayer life. They make you miserable. But you have the power by the grace of God. You have the ability by the grace of God to come before the altar today and say, God, I surrender my anger before you. Set me free. Set me free. I don't want these people to control my life again. I know I was a victim, but I refuse to be a victim anymore from this day forward. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. Five forms of anger listed In verse 31, one is bitterness. Bitterness is a deep-seated anger that leads to emotional outbursts or overflow in the form of curses, harsh words, and it sits in the heart like a bitter gall. When a person nurses and keeps bitterness, they naturally emit bitter vibes. 
they engender animosity. And your life is full of bitterness. Imagine I have these two drinks. If one was red, and it represents bitterness, and I add this one to it, do you think I will get that clean water? When bitterness sits inside, you cannot accommodate love. You cannot give love. When bitterness sits inside, you turn towards yourself. You cease to flourish because you can't see the world for what it is. The second is wrath, wrath or rage. That form of anger is the most violent external manifestation of anger. Those who get so angry, they charge and they hit things. I like to tell my students, they are very lucky, those who like to hit walls, that they live in the North Shore. <laughs> when they get angry and they hit the walls, they think it's an opportunity to vent their anger really well and go like that and break some things. Where I grew up, <laughs> it's concrete and cement blocks. <laughs> you get angry, you hit it once. You learn the lesson really well. <laughs> you break some bones into pieces, some fluid begin to ooze out, and they call it blood. You look at it and go, I won't do this again. <laughs> you see, but there are people who are angry not because they themselves are bad, because other people cause them anger legitimately, but they allowed it to sit. Proverbs says, a man, Proverbs 15 verse 18, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. Proverbs 22, 24, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angry. On the list of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, the third on the list is anger. That is the kind of anger that is quiet, seated there. You know those people, they are angry, but they keep their cool. Sometimes they behave like a turtle on the water. You know, they look cool from the surface, but the leg is... <laughs> Have you tried to tickle someone who is angry? <laughs> Do you want to try? Now, if you try at home, don't put it in my account. <laughs> but people who have that seated anger silently, even if you are trying to have fun with them, it's like tickling someone who is angry. They are full of anger inside. They can't have fun. You say something, huh. <laughs> oh. If you spend one hour with them, you have five things to apologize for. <laughs> you know those people. That's why you are laughing. Maybe you are one of them. I didn't say it. The fourth on the list is clamor. Angry shouting, outcry, and yelling. Paul says, let this be removed from you. That is the kind of anger that is manifested when people, somebody cuts you on the road, you go, yeah. You know that the engine is running. You know that the wind is, the person cannot hear you, but you are still there. Oh, you, you, who do you think you are? <laughs> you see, if you don't deal with what is in the inside, you can be deceived by the worldly standard that says, if only you surround yourself with the right things, if you only you manipulate people to be around you, you will be happy. You know that those things don't make people happy. You know that those things don't bring satisfaction and flourishing. You know that those things don't make you live life in its fullness. 
Let these forms of anger be taken from you. The fifth one is the anger that comes in the form of blasphemy. Speaking evil against God and slandering other people. People who did not cause you anger, you still slander them. Because what is in the inside here is driving everything. Friends, anger can rob you of tranquility, joy, and peace. Anger can destroy you and your relationships. Anger is a trigger for a stressful life. And anger increases stress. As stress increases anger. They have symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationship. And notice, a heart full of anger cannot contain or give love. A mind filled with anger thinks no positive thoughts. An emotion trapped in anger Tends towards self. Self pity. Selfishness. Self interest. Everything is self. But my prayer and my hope is today God will set you free. God will deliver you that you launch. Two days from now, as you get into 2019, you roll all this behind you. You step into a new year as a victor, not a victim. As a foe to anger, not a friend to anger. With a new drive to flourish. With a new drive, point number three, to flourish. The drive to flourish quickly comes in verse 31. It comes in a form of kindness. To be able to be pleasant, easy, benevolent, being morally good, being able to be compassionate. Angry people cannot even empathize with people. Do you know that? Angry people cannot have sympathy because it's all about them. So drive to flourish, number one is kindness. Number two is tender-heartedness. The word means the feeling towards others that comes in the form of compassion or affection. Being able to give from the flow, the abundant flow of a heart that is free and strengthened. I mean, the Greek word, some of the Greek philosophers use the word in a way that I like the most. That is the word used for healthy bowel. (laughs) Healthy bowel. Don't you love that? Because the mechanisms up there is good enough to digest whatever it takes to process and eliminate waste without containing or absorbing what is not needed. To be free to flourish, we need kindness and we need a tender heart. And three, forgiveness. Forgiveness in this sense is a grant to grant as a favor. To forgive as a gracious act. Please, please understand me here. Forgiveness in this passage here has nothing to do with cause. Forgiveness is what you choose to do so that you will be free. You don't need the apology of the one who wronged you to forgive. The word here is a gracious act. In other words, the other synonym is a pardon. So that you will be free. It does not mean reconciliation. Please understand, forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same. God wants you to give to let the pain go. To bring it at the foot of the cross and be released. If the person who wronged you change and they change your behavior well, 
maybe you will reconcile. But if they decide to change, you give them no power to rule you with anger. Forgive. As God in Christ forgave. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to be free to flourish reminds me about a story I read recently. According to an excerpt of the book, Why Forgive? In Plough Cotterley, Stephen MacDonald was a young police officer in 1986 when he was shot by a teenager in New York's Central Park. An incident that left him paralyzed. I forgive the shooter because I believe the only thing worse than receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. The police officer right. If you are going to be free to flourish, I leave Pastor Tim and the pastoral team to continue to work on the subject fear. But today, I want to encourage you to bring your anger to the foot of the cross. To ask Jesus to set you free. To ask Jesus to reach out to your heart and your mind. To deliver you from anger, from rage, from bitterness. To make you free to flourish in 2019. To flourish in kindness. To flourish with tender heart. To flourish in the spirit of forgiveness. It is God's will that you live to your maximum potential. It is God's will that you are a blessing to people you encounter. It is God's will that you find peace, love, and joy in your life in 2019. But anger stands to take that away from you. In a minute, I'd like you to bow down your heads with me. Take a moment to reflect on anger. That is taking the best away from you. Talk to God about it. Ask him to deliver you this morning. And heads bow and eyes closed. If you are here in this room, I said, you know, you talk about free to flourish as Jesus offers. But I even don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. Today, I want to give my life to him. I encourage you today to raise your hand as a sign that you want to give your life to Jesus Christ today. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Counted four or five hands. Anyone want to give their life to Christ? Eyes closed, heads bowed. For those who have who raised your hands? I encourage you to walk forward as the service goes to an end to talk to those in front here to pray with you and to guide you. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior will set you free and free indeed. But for the rest who are still praying about this issue, anger, I want you to join me in prayer for a moment. Believe with me to break the chains to bring the stronghold, the things that have become part of your life. Today, I challenge you to realize that it is not God's gift for you to live in bitterness, to live in rage and anger and wrath, fuming all the time. God is here to set you free. Believe with me as I cry out to God today on your behalf that you will be set free. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you this day. 
I pray for the last Sunday of the year 2018. I ask for your grace and your deliverance. For anyone in this room trapped in anger, controlled by anger, wanted to be set free from the various forms of anger I've spoken about. In the name of Jesus, I command that anger to get out of their lives. I break the stronghold of the forces of evil. I break satanic strongholds and release these individuals from their grip. For your word said, if we will ask in your name, you will do it. And if the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I pray your freedom become their portion. Your deliverance become their portion. That they will launch into the year free to flourish. Free to thrive because they have encountered you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please, the altar's altar is open. You may come before the altar and cry out to God. You may ask my dear brothers and sisters to join you in prayer. It is my prayer and my hope that you will be free to flourish in 2019. You will cease to be a prisoner of anger. And the joy of the Lord will be your portion. God bless you.